uh, she apparently was trying to say that those 59 people who had died, God had called them to come home. This invitational hymn was turned into a tribute that really, and I'm not passing judgment on those 59 people, I don't know them. But somehow that song that called people to God was being used to usher people into heaven, whether they were ready or not, we don't know. And as I thought about that, as I read this passage that I just read to you, I thought of that, and I hope you, well, I guess I'm not going to apologize for what I'm saying. The Jews in this story that I, or this passage that I just read to you, were in captivity, as I said. They were in Babylon as captives. When, and, and God, through his prophet Jeremiah, had told those people, basically there are going to be three categories of people left when I'm done wiping out your land. Now, understand that it wasn't God's great purpose to wipe out their land. Really, what God said was, I'm going to lift my hand of restraint against your enemies because you do not trust me. And I'm going to let them have their way. And when it's done, there's going to be three categories of people. Number one, there's going to be the people who are just wiped out, dead, gone. There's going to be those who were left in the land. I'm going to talk about them in a minute. But then there's this category, the, those who were carried away to Babylon. And I, it's, it, I've talked about this recently, and I hope you recall that the reason some were left behind and some were taken was because it was the way of, of conquering kings in that day that they would take over a land. And, and mind you, I just they didn't have cars, cell phones, and airplanes. Right? Everything that was long distance took time. So a, a man who was going to conquer the world had to have a plan that fit into the times, and that plan was this. They would take the people who were the, the thinkers, the educated, the people who drove society, politicians, uh, people who, were, who had jobs that were in the upper echelon, of even earning power. They took those people away because they were the ones who would have been most likely to mount uh, a successful rebellion against the conquering king. So they took them into their own land and they dispersed them so that they couldn't come together. And so they were settled in, in, in little towns and places here and there. And that's where we found this scene that we read this morning right here in Ezekiel chapter 33. The people who were left behind were the people who were lower in society. They were the oppressed often. And they were people who hadn't had much, and now the land's wiped out, and yet it's still land. And so that conquering king would say to these kind of people, look, I'm giving you a vineyard, and I'm giving you a farm, and it has a house on it. It just needs a little fixing up, you know, after we demolished it. And they were just happy to have something. And so, that's, that's the three categories, and that's why they were. But these people that we, were just, that we just read of are those, that third category that finds themselves in Babylon. This is what struck me. These people were religious people. They found joy in listening to Ezekiel preach to them. They knew that, that Ezekiel was from Jehovah. And they had never, for the most part, society in, in Jerusalem that had been conquered hadn't cut God off. He just simply became 
another God among many. And yet we understand that God won't be a God. Jehovah God, the real God, the true God, will not be a God, one God among many. He must be first in your life. That's the very first things that we find in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods. Not, not thou shalt have no other gods in front of me, but beside me. Thou shalt have no other god is what that means. You can't bring another one in with me. That's how it works. One god and if you're going to serve the one true God, you're going to serve Him and Him only. And so, we see that these people, because they have violated those commandments, and because they wouldn't listen to God, and they were in rebellion against God, in their very heart, it was who they were. It went down into the very roots, into the depths of their soul that they were in rebellion against God because they wouldn't have him and him only. However, as, as I said, we read here, they invited Ezekiel, come preach to us. Tell us. Tell us what God would have us to hear. And so he did. And, and it wasn't just anybody. You see, God had sent that faithful prophet to proclaim his truth. And so he did. So, so here's the picture. In their town, far away in Babylon, they get together and they say, you know what? Let's all get together and we'll invite Ezekiel to speak to us. Let's hear what he has to say. And Ezekiel does that. And they leave that place going, wow, wow. He did a really good job. He is a good preacher. Hard to find a better speaker than Ezekiel. He can really lay it out there and keep your attention for an hour and a half. They said it was pleasant. They hear my words, but they will not do them. Lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice. You see why that might have reminded me of a country music singer standing on a stage before some pretty vile people singing a sacred song. And when she was finished, they applauded her no doubt wiped tears from their eyes and said that was a pleasant performance. It was really good. That was really touching. But these people, as other people who do the same thing, are only giving lip service to God. And I read that to you, and I'll read it to you again. For with their mouth they show much love. They're, they're in exile because of their sin, and now they've brought themselves to say, boy, that was a good sermon that Ezekiel gave. And he had it organized well, and he delivered it well, and you could hear him. And he made his points, and he had it all lined up. And we just love him. With their hearts... I'm sorry, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. You see, covetousness. Is that a word you expected? I don't know. But therein was their sin. For it, you can read all of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all into the minor prophets. Their sin is named. Oh, First of all, they didn't worship God as God. 
But that bled into the rest of their lives. So while they didn't recognize Jehovah God as an all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipotent, omniscient God, that affected the rest of their life. Because then it was no big deal if they took advantage of a situation. If they, maybe it was legally, it was with, they would win in court, and yet they would steal something from somebody simply because that person didn't have the wherewithal to defend what was theirs. See, and, and you find this once again. This, this was part of their sin, was that their judges, who were to judge justice, deliver justice for the people, could actually be bought off and apparently most of the time were. And what God accused them of doing was stealing from widows and the fatherless. You see, God had laid out his law in the beginning when he made civil law for this group of people that they were to be given their property. That land is theirs, and it's marked out at the corners with landmarks and they found a dozen different ways to steal from those. They might, they might get up in the middle of the night and just move that line over, move that landmark. And it was a widow who had lost her husband. That's her land. It's her children's land. God gave it to them. Now it's being stolen. She might try to go to court in this circumstance. She might try to go to court and the rich man who's stealing her property slips some money to the judge and he's going to win. That's the kind of stuff that was going on. So now, and that's obviously in a whole list of sins. That wasn't all. For the prophet told them, your streets have run with blood of innocent people. And murder happened, and they got away with it for the same reason. What am I talking about? I'm talking about covetousness. There were those who controlled society who were willing to do whatever it took to get what they wanted. And right there, it just got real personal for us, didn't it? Not everybody was involved in that. But it was the rule. And it was because that happened that God said, I've had enough. But it didn't start with murder. It didn't start with stealing with the approval of crooked government officials. It started with not recognizing God for who he was. And it, uh, it took away the moral underpinning of all of society. So here they are. Because of that sin, God is punishing them. They're in exile. They call the prophet and he preaches and they say, he has such a nice voice. That was such a good thing. And yet, deep down in their hearts, nothing has changed. I told you three categories of people, the dead ones, the ones who have been carried away into Babylon, and the ones who remained behind. Mind you, the ones who remained behind were in what had been a beautiful city was demolished. When Nebuchadnezzar was done in 586 B.C. He had broken down the walls. He had burned the rich men's houses. He had knocked down the temple, and he had run plows up and down the streets of Jerusalem. And yet we've seen things and, and places many, many years after it seems they've been abandoned, and yet you can go, hey, look at those 
apple trees out in the orchard. Somebody, somewhere along the line, must have done a good job of taking care of things. Or maybe it's some other, some other fruit or plants that may have been planted. And so these people who are left behind, they were the ones who, who were lower in society. doesn't mean they were good people necessarily. As you are probably well aware, those who are in control and who are doing evil things have people that are, are on the underside of society that will do their bidding. And yet, when push comes to shove, they're the ones who will go to prison, not the ones who have orchestrated the deed. Those are the kind of people that were left behind. The ones who were fatherless, the widows, and Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet. God had told him, because Jeremiah suffered many things, I talked about this, Jeremiah had suffered many things, and when it was all said and done, God had told him, you're suffering as far as being persecuted and, and put into prison and, and all of those things. That's changed, but I'll leave you in your beloved land. Even in these circumstances, there was Jeremiah. He wasn't done either, by the way, with being a prophet. We can go to Jeremiah chapter 42. I'm going to read one verse to you, so you don't have to turn there. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good, whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God, to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us. And when we obey the voice, I'm sorry, when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, here are these people who said, okay, Jeremiah, we're coming to you. We're the ones who are left behind. You tell us what God wants us to do. Whatever God says to us, We'll do it. Now, the back story is that when there was always somebody in charge, right? The conquering Nebuchadnezzar's people, he, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't, he was still back in Babylon. It was his captains and his generals that had come and wiped out the land, and they took the last king back to Babylon, and they it's, poked out his eyes and all kinds of mean things. and uh, But they left, understanding that there had to be somebody in charge. So they put a guy in charge. His name was Gedaliah. That's the, that's the best pronunciation I have, at least. And uh, they left him in charge, and he was the governor, if you will. I was talking to somebody this week about what I had read here, and, and at, at one point, the armies of Israel had been probably close to a million men, okay? 700,000 to a million. That's how many people had been in the army that defended Israel in its golden years, when, when it was most prosperous. Now what's going on with these people left behind in the land is there's bands of 10. We find as many as 80 come together, and, and one of these bands came in and they killed Gedaliah. And then the, the guy who was leading them, he was the one that brought the people to Jeremiah because they were scared. They had killed the governor that, was, that the king who had conquered them and left in charge. They were scared. So they came to Jeremiah and said, okay, we've come to ask you what God would have us to do. Up to that point, up to the point where they were completely wiped out, Jeremiah had been telling the people, this is going to happen to you. You might as well just surrender and go back to Babylon. And they wouldn't do it. But now he's telling them, they're saying, really, we think we should go to Egypt and we'll be safe there because Nebuchadnezzar won't ever come down there. Right? That's what he said. And so 
they went to Jeremiah, and, and, and Jeremiah said, no, if you want to be safe, stay right where you are. They weren't in Jerusalem anymore. Jerusalem was pretty much wiped out. They were in a little town, and he said, stay right here. <clears throat> and they said, we will do whatever God tells us through you to do. And then, just a few verses later, they say this. Well, let, let me back up. This is actually Jeremiah talking because he had told them and he knew even then what they were going to do. He said, for ye dissembled in your hearts. And that simply means you lied. You said one thing to me and in your heart you knew you were going to do something different. When you sent me unto the Lord your God saying, pray for us unto the Lord our God and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us and we will do it. And now I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for which, for the which he hath sent me unto you. And here's the pronunciation. Now therefore know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place whither you desire to go and sojourn, and that would have been Egypt. <clears throat> now, we go into the next chapter. This is, this is, these are astonishing words to me once again. For now, these men didn't only go to Egypt, but they made Jeremiah go down there with them. Imagine that, but that's what they did. And Jeremiah never stops preaching, but this is what they said in verse Jeremiah 44, 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. And that would have been a goddess that they had worshipped, of course. And to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals, we were well, and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense, that means they stopped doing it, to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And when we burned incense unto the queen of heaven, and poured out our drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her, and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? And that's a question. For the men were trying to apparently blame the women. And the women said, no, this is what we're going to do, but it's, we didn't do it by ourselves. But the astonishing thing there isn't that they would blame somebody else. It's simply that they had this perspective. And, and we look on and go, they're crazy. How could they have believed that? Because we have a different perspective from the Scripture. We're seeing the whole, uh, that whole part of history played out. And we understand that it was Jehovah God in their midst that had made them to prosper. And it was His mercy that even as they were sacrificing to the Queen of Heaven, that they weren't completely consumed. Instantly. But in their lifetime, okay, do, do you understand what I'm saying? We, we don't live that long. And by the way, it's, it's wisdom to understand that. But we don't live that long. And so in the 30 or 40 years maybe that they had spent on this earth, that's all they had known was idol worship mixed with the worship of Jehovah. And we could say, so how would they even know except that God had sent Jeremiah, and he had over and over again told them that, and yet they believed that it was their idol sacrifices that had brought them prosperity. And they had the prophet Jeremiah with them in Egypt, and they wouldn't listen to him. So because of their blindness, 
They proudly proclaimed to God's own prophet that they would continue to sacrifice to the queen of heaven because that's what had brought them their prosperity. And they'd been doing great until they stopped. I, when, whenever I'm preaching like this and getting ready, it's, it's a little bit burdensome because there's some frightening thoughts that I'm going to share with you. People can be religious and yet be covetous at the same time. And what we see is that religiosity and rebellion can coexist. People can be deceived. This is number two. People can be deceived believing to be right with God or with the gods while being under judgment from God. We can have God's messenger or messengers among us and be so deceived and hardened in our hearts that we cannot hear what is truth. As I mentioned, I've been reading this, and, and it's a lot to have laying on you at one time. However, the good news is, I have been studying through my, my schooling in the New Testament. And so to offset that, I've been reading through 1 Corinthians and studying through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and, and I had it marked in the wrong Bible. So I'm going to look it up here real quickly, if you'll bear with me. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's just, the whole chapter has so much to say. But verse 17 is one that we all know well. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled, listen, God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God's great purpose is reconciliation. I mentioned that those people in, that were speaking to Jeremiah had a very, very small perspective. We, as we read Scripture, have a broader perspective. They saw only that while they had worshipped and, and offered sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven, that they seemed to have prosperity. We stand back and go, but actually you have lost prosperity. It was headed downhill for many, many, many years because we read it in history. But then we have a broader pers uh, perspective even yet. All of Scripture saying to us what we read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came and gave himself to be sacrificed, shed his blood, die on the cross. It was all God's purpose so that we could have our sinful hearts changed. That's what those people needed. And God knew it, and it was in his plan all along, because they weren't, they weren't unique in that. We're all born sinful, is what I'm trying to say. And those people had strayed far from God, and yet among them, and not just Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but among them, no doubt, there were people who said, this isn't right, we know who God is. And in their corner, they did their best to do what was right. I guess the reason that these, these, this history uh, strikes me so much is because I do see parallels in our world today. It's not hard to see 
more and more our society is headed downhill. There's a lot of things that we could talk about. We see them often. I've, I've seen them week after week, and you have too. But there's good news, and it's that God's great purpose is still reconciliation. And he gave himself for that purpose. And he's made it possible for us to be completely changed. That's what we read. We can be made a new creature. Even in the midst of people rejecting God, we don't have to. God is still reaching out. He's still calling. And he's still saying to you and I, we can be made a new creature in Christ. And I read clear through the end of that chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because we're given a purpose by God. You see, we live also in an age where there's a lot of anxiety and depression because people are going through life without hope and without a purpose. And yet, in being made a new creature, we're given hope and a purpose. What is that purpose? It's what I read to you, that we are then made ambassadors for Christ. And, and the Apostle Paul was saying, God did all of these things for us to reconcile the world to himself, and then he reconciles us, and he sends us out, and he says, you will stand in my place. This, the, that's what he said. Um, now we are ambassadors for Christ, and he's, um, as though God did beseech you by us. And so we stand in Christ's place going and talking to people and saying, do you know what God can do for you? Let me pray for you. That's our purpose here and now. It's a purpose that's going to extend into eternity. This is just the beginning. We are eternal creatures. So we've been given a purpose. And while the lessons that we talked about this morning can be very, very sobering, while we see God's judgment in practice, the whole counsel of Scripture gives us hope. But in order to avail ourselves of God's provision for our redemption, we need to recognize some things. We have to be honest. We can't just coast. We have to recognize our own sinfulness. Without God, we are dead in trespasses and sins. John the Baptist called people to repentance. Jesus called people to repentance. The message of the apostles after Pentecost was repentance. We not only need to recognize our own sinfulness, but we need to recognize that we need to turn from our wicked, sinful ways. A rebellion against God. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. But deep in our hearts, without God changing us, we have the very thing within us that these people that we found in the Old Testament had. And we need to turn from that and say, God, I am wicked, sinful, rebelling against you, and I recognize that the only answer for my life is a Savior. And we turn to the Savior, who is rich in mercy. And I'm going to read to you, I mentioned this, this song. I'm going to read to you before we go, the verses to this song, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Calling for you and for me. Patiently, Jesus is waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? mercies for you and for me time is now fleeting the moments are passing passing from you and from me shadows are gathering deathbeds are coming coming for you and for me oh for the wonderful love he has promised Promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and 
hardened. Hardened for you and for me. Let's stand together. And as you're standing, the chorus goes like this. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. If you're lost, if you find yourself far from God this morning, those words are for you. And he's inviting you. In fact, he stands at the door and knocks, patiently waiting. And he's calling to you this morning, come home. You're far from home, but you can come home this morning. If that's you and you'd like to pray this morning, you're welcome to come to the front. We would be happy to pray with you. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Lord, we, we confess our own weakness in delivering the message of hope and deliverance that you offer to people who are hurting and lost. And yet, Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is alive and well and moving among us, and you can go to people's hearts, and you can speak to the hearts that need to hear the message the most. And we're asking that you do that this morning. Help us, Lord, to take the message of your word seriously. We're not trifling with emotions, feelings, and vague ideas. But on a Sunday morning, when we've come together, once again, we're being called to consider the condition of our souls. Help us to understand that deep, deep within our hearts. Lord, we pray that You'll go with those who might be here this morning that you're talking to deep in their hearts. Your Holy Spirit is ministering. Lord, we pray that you'll help us as we leave this place. Your Holy Spirit go with us. Help us to pray for each other, to love each other. Hold each other up before you that we all may be made into the image of your Son. Lord, move on us, we pray. You know the desires of our heart. We pray that your, your will be done among us. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us in the, in the part of uh, the service that comes after this, Lord. We pray that you'll help us, but help us not to get away from you calling softly and tenderly. Come home. Come home. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for your attention. God bless each of you. Just a few minutes we'll be gathering up here.